All right, well, hello, everybody. My name is Professor Thomas, and I'm going to be your instructor for the semester. And physiology is a very interesting course because anatomy is where you learn about the structures of things. Physiology is you learn how the structures in our body work to help us survive. And I tell my students on the first day, and it's a bit interesting today because this is a online course and I'll be mainly interacting with you through videos, but physiology is really about two things. One is concentration gradients and two, surface area development. Because it's amazing how we are one individual. However, we're made up of basically 60 trillion tiny units called cells. Meanwhile, these cells are bathed in water, and these cells, all 60 trillion of these cells, get nutrients from a part of our body called the blood. And I didn't label that, so I'm going to go ahead and label that here. So right now, your cells are going through untold processes, millions of processes. And to do so, they need a source of nutrients, and they need something that's going to eliminate wastes. <clears throat> so first, just to kind of clarify for you, three systems in the, or three parts of the body that transport nutrients, blood, then it travels through the interstitial space, then it goes to the intracellular em environment, and waste products go reverse. So think of the intracellular space, think of this as the buffer zone between the blood and the intracellular space. And the blood is very important because the blood is very similar to a transport system or a freeway system in our society. It is how our cells get everything that they need. Let's just talk, and normally this would be the part where I ask the students to volunteer what are some things that are carried through our blood? Can't really do that now, so I'll go ahead and just uh, throw it at you. And the first thing is going to be oxygen. So oxygen, or O2, is carried through the blood. In fact, it's something we'll talk about later on this semester. It is a type of protein called hemoglobin. And oxygen is very important because it needs to actually go to our cells. So it travels through the blood, through the intracellular space, and into the intracellular environment. And as I said, we have about 60 trillion cells. Okay. Now what else is, is, tra is transported through the blood? Well, we have nutrients. Think about the last meal you ate. What happened to it? Well, what happened is that, is that whatever you ate went down your esophagus into a giant bag called the stomach, and the stomach used a bunch of corrosive acids and enzymes to basically break down this food into a ball of mush. As the ball of mush traveled through your intestines, it was more or less liquefied and absorbed into your blood. So every nutrient that you take in is going to be transported through your blood. Except for fats, they go through a slightly different system, but we'll cover that when the time comes. So nutrients travel through your blood and they also get into your cells. Now there are some other things that are very important to get into your blood as well. Ions, also known as charged atoms and charged molecules. So we have ions. They're also very important to go into your cells. You probably know that there are some popular drinks that have these ions, which I guess I guess the buzz term is electrolytes. Gatorade, for example, even though it's largely sugar, unless you buy the low sugar versions, is that Gatorade is full of ions that your cells need for activity, like sodium, potassium, so on and so forth. So those are just some examples of things that, that 
are transported through our blood that go into our cells. It's very important that our cells have a constant supply of these nutrients because cells are very energy hungry things, especially the cells in our brain called neurons. And if they don't get enough oxygen, nutrients, and ions, then sometimes they just turn off. Neurons in the brain, they do not do well with being deprived of their essentials. And if that's the case, somebody can lose consciousness really fast if their blood is not circulating at the, at the correct speed. Which, how fast does, does blood circulate throughout the body? Uh, the equivalent of about four miles an hour, uh, uh, give or take. So it's traveling through a pretty good, good speed. And it, and it needs to, to innervate all 60 trillion of our, of our cells. Now, our cells are also extremely um, liberal about how, how they dispense their waste. And cells, they are currently undergoing millions of metabolic reactions. And what they are, are going to do is they're going to take their metabolic waste products and they are going to return them to the blood. So examples here will be metabolic waste products. And these are extremely numerous, I'm not going to go into them all. And these also go from the cells to the interstitial space to the blood. Because one thing to keep in mind is that water is the main transport medium in our body. You cannot have transport through thin air. Everything has to travel through water, which is why our body is bathed in water. If it was not, we could not transport. And another metabolic waste product is going to be carbon dioxide, or CO2 as it's, as it's called. CO2 is also going to be dumped into our blood. And then our body has to deal with that because CO2, as we'll talk about later on this semester, is not good for long periods of time in the blood. It actually, not to spoil it, but it, carbon dioxide reacts strongly with water to form acidic products. All right, so let me just look at the outline and make sure that I covered everything for you guys. And by the way, you're probably curious about my, about my shirt. I am a full-time teacher at a high school called La Reina High School. It's a small all-girls all school in Thousand Oaks. And they've been nice enough this summer to let me come in and use, my, use this classroom for our recordings. So I will be giving you a mix of lectures in my classroom here, but also I have a drawing tablet at, at home, so sometimes you'll also get a lecture delivered through one of my um, my, uh, my drawing tablets. So it will be a mix of those two. All right, so that is our recap. Three environments in the body, blood, the interstitial space, and, and the intracellular environment. The idea is, is that blood gives nutrients and essentials to our cells and then our cells take their waste products and put them into our blood. And then it is expelled from the body in one form or another. All right. Well, if you have any, any questions, this is just a reminder that I will be online for office hours, 5.30 to about 6.30ish from Monday through Thursday. All right. This is part one of uh, chapter five. And next part is going to be the cellular membrane uh, function. Okay, everybody, well, welcome back. So now we're on the next part of our outline, which is going to be the cell membrane, its properties, and why it's so important that we learn it. Well, as I said, is that we are made up of 60 trillion cells that are constantly transporting things. Think of a cell as a busy shopping center, sorry, a busy indoor mall or a Costco. The people going in represents all the things going into the cell. People going out, they represent all the, all the things going out of the cell. So things are constantly moving in and out of the cell. And what's interesting about the cell is that animal cells, at least, 
are made up of something called a phospholipid cell bilayer. In fact, if you remember from your introductory biology class, is it's called a semipermeable membrane. So I'm going to write this on top here. Actually, I'll do it off to the side so it doesn't get in the way. Semipermeable membrane. So we know that semi means kind of. And we know permeable means pass through. So this means that this, this membrane, things can kind of pass through it, which is right. Because there are certain things that can go into the cell and out of the cell without, without any impediment. And, there, and then there's things that actually cannot freely move, move through the cell, so they need some help. So first of all, let's talk about some things that can just freely go inside the cell. Well, actually. Before we do that, let's talk about what gives the cell membrane its semi-permeable properties uh, to begin with. Now, as you see here, I only drew one part of, of how the cell membrane looks because it would take a while to do this entire thing. But if you look here, it looks like I drew some circles on the top of the cell membrane and on the inside. And that's because these heads here, called glycerol heads, they actually are exposed to any environment that has that is made up of water, which is everything. And that's because these heads are what we call hydrophilic, meaning that the heads, they are able to exist in water. But what's interesting is that these heads make up one half of what is called a phospholipid. So I'm going to write this on top here, phospholipid. And a phospholipid is the building block of the animal cell membrane. So what happens here is that the top part of it is a type of carbohydrate called glycerol, and the bottom part is made up of fatty acid tails. Now what's interesting is that these fatty acid tails are what we call hydrophobic, meaning they do not get along well with water. And if any of you have done that experiment where you mix oil and water, you'll see that they don't mix. You'll see that water really does not pass through lipids easily. So because of that, let's say you were to take a handful of phospholipids and throw them into water. They would automatically arrange in a shape very similar to this. They would arrange so that the tails are hidden from the water, but that the heads are ex exposed. So therefore, you can almost compare the phospholipid membrane to a, to, a, to a hamburger, is that the bun on each side is kind of like the glycerol heads, and all the stuff in the, the middle is, is like the hydrophobic tails. Now, because of that, there are some things that can freely pass through and some things that cannot freely pass, pass through. And by the way, we'll talk about this in a bit, but this is called simple diffusion. So let's, let's talk about first things that can pass through easily without any impediment. So I'm going to put over here, let me make sure the camera, yeah, yeah, you guys can see this. So the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be freely permeable. Freely permeable, meaning that these are things that can pass through the cell membrane without anything stopping them. And the first thing is going to be gases. Gases can freely pass through the cell membrane. Other than that, we can have things called small, nonpolar molecules. These are very small molecules that are nonpolar. And how they work is that they can actually sneak in between the glycerol heads and only interact with the hydrophobic tails. They're that small. And things that are small, small hydrophobic molecules are mainly steroids, so steroid hormones, but also many pharmaceuticals are designed in order to be very small and nonpolar. They can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So examples of these are going to be steroid hormones. 
Um, now, water is a tricky one. And I say that water is tricky because if you were to leave water and fats together for a long enough period of time, some water can sneak through, but it is very slow. So water can, just because of water's properties, water can freely diffuse through the cell membrane. It would just take a very long time. And water, as we know, water needs to, to get into the cells. They can do so with water channels. We'll talk about what a, what a channel is in a, in a second. But they can actually get through water channels that are always open called aquaporins. So I like to put down that water is freely permeable, but I kind of put an asterisk by it because yes, it is freely permeable, but at the same time, it's not classically permeable. So I'm gonna go ahead and put water here with an asterisk. Okay, now what cannot pass through the cell membrane? Um, everything else. Now this doesn't mean that they can't get in or out of the cell. It just means that if they were to try and, and go through the cell membrane, they could not. They need help. And they can get help for something that's called a protein transporter that we'll talk about. But on their own, they cannot freely pass through. Some examples of that, so I'm going to put here, impermeable. And the first thing that is impermeable is going to be iron. Anything charged cannot pass through the cell membrane on its own. Ions also need channel protein that we'll talk about. Large polar molecules. Proteins, for example, sugars, um, those are things that cannot freely pass through. They can, but they need something called a carrier, a protein carrier. And we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. So ions, large polar molecules, basically anything large. I know that sounds... Uh, I know that sounds kind of obvious, but things, things that are very large cannot freely move, move through the cell membrane. They have a separate method of doing so called endocytosis, meaning inside the cell. But those are things that are impermeable to the cell membrane. All right, now there are other things on top of the cell membrane. And one thing I'm going to draw here is going to be transporters. So these are called transporters, and there's a couple of them. This is called a channel protein. So what these, these are is that they're proteins that actually go through the entire width of the cell, meaning they expand from one side to the other. And I guess an example would, would be a tunnel in a, in a mountain. You, you cannot pass through a mountain unless there's a tunnel there. Well, it's the same thing in the cell, except in the cell it's called a channel. So the, so the channel goes through the cell membrane and it allows for a specific type of uh, molecule to pass through. So not just any molecule, it has to be a specific one. Like there's channels for sodium ions, there's channels for potassium ions, there's channels for water. So channels have to be specific. So let me erase this part of the cell membrane here. We also have something called a carrier. And carriers, what these do is they're kind of like escorts. What they do is that a very large molecule needs to be escorted from one side of the cell to the other. It isn't just a channel that opens up and does and does such a through. This actually has to carry along the the product to go from one side of the cell to the other. 
And carriers have very large things. They transport large things like protein, sugars. So channels deal with, with um, smaller types of, of molecules where carriers move through larger things. Think of it like an aircraft carrier, very, very large, transports very large things. What carrier, um, uh, what carrier proteins are very similar is they transport in very large things. Like an example of a carrier protein would be the GLUT transporter. What it, what it does is it transports glucose from one side of the cell membrane to the other. So these are the two um, uh, types of protein transporters we're going to talk about. Next thing that's on the cell surface, let me make sure I'm going in line with the enzymes. So we don't talk about these too much, but there's actually types of proteins on the cell surface called enzymes. And if you remember, what enzymes do is they catalyze chemical reactions, meaning that they actually allow chemical reactions to happen faster. So I'm just going to draw an example here. This here will be an enzyme. As I said, we'll go over specific examples as the semester progresses. But enzymes are responsible for catalyzing chemical reactions. Now the next thing, and this is something very important, is cell communication proteins called receptors. So draw this over here. This is a special type of receptor called a G-protein coupled receptor, but it's a receptor. What receptors do is that they receive specific molecules that instruct the cell to do something. This is the way that our cells, cells communicate. For example, our cardiac muscle has receptors for a hormone called epinephrine. What this hormone does is it binds with the receptor that's on the cell. It's called a beta-1 receptor. And it tells the, the cardiac tissue to contract harder and faster. Now, it's not actually giving the cell anything new. It's just it's telling it something. So receptors is how hormones and other signaling molecules um, can go from one cell to another and tell it to do a job. But Receptors receive specific signaling molecules. Not all cells have the same receptors. So receptors are, are how cells, cells communicate with each other. Um, next we have something called ad, adhesion proteins. And I'll just draw these. Let's see, I'll go ahead and use a flat for this. Adhesion proteins, what they do is they anchor one cell to another. So let me just draw kind of a cell here, tiny cell here, so you can kind of see how, how it works. So what it does is we know that tissues are made up of cells. However, as you learned about in anatomy, if you're going to look at a cell that's under or, or tissue that's that's underneath beneath the microscope, you'll see that all the cells are very closely packed together. And that's because they're held together with these adhesion proteins. What they do is that they make the cells continuous with one another. Now, this might seem kind of hard to comprehend because throughout all of your lives, every time you've seen a cell in a textbook, it's been a random circle looking thing with a bunch of stuff packed inside. Well, I am here to tell you that that is really only a teaching model. A cell like that does not exist. There's actually not there's more cells than not that are that are bound to bound to together than cells that are just free free floating around. So cells are stuck to together with adhesion proteins. For example, our skin is made up of a bunch of types of cells called keratinocytes. Of course, the ones on, on the epidermis, the very top, are dead, but they're all anchored together with these adhesion proteins to keep them continuous. And that's why our, why our skin is such a good barrier from anything um, 
from the outside environment getting into our to our uh, our our inside environment. Okay, and also cells actually have things on them that act as identifiers, mainly sugar patterns. If you look at most cells underneath a very very powerful microscope, you'll see that there's a, a bunch of almost looks like almost cotton candy ish on on top. And there's a bunch of proteins and carbohydrate patterns. So cells also have on them identifiers. These identifiers are important because our immune system, when we are born, the, the immune system has to learn what belongs in our body and what doesn't belong in our, in our body. And it does so by learning what type of identifiers are present on our cells. That's why if you have type A blood, that means you have blood that have A proteins on them. Your immune system learns that these cells um, with the A proteins are your blood cells. If you get blood cells that have a B protein on them, your immune system will identify that B protein as being foreign. Even though that B protein serves no threat to your body, your immune system does not know that. So it will, it will, will, it will trigger an oftentimes fatal immune response. So I, identifiers help our cells identify what belongs and what doesn't. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap this. Let me make sure we have everything here. It looks like we do. So our cells are made up of something called phospholipids. These are very... Um, these are, are, are very basic building blocks. They're not cells. It is just a head of something called, called glycerol attached to fatty acid tails. And they actually make up the cell membrane. I don't think I mentioned this, but the advantage of it is that it gives our cells a lot of flexibility as far as our shape goes. If you poke yourself, you're, you're slightly deforming your cells, but that's okay. These, these cells made up of phospholipids are designed to bend a bit. So, so we know that these, this phospholipid membrane gives our cells some properties as far as allowing things to either enter or exit. I did put over here uh, so some things that can pass through, but things that can pass through are going to be gases, small nonpolar molecules, and to an extent water. Things that are impermeable are ions, large polar molecules, and basically anything large in general. We know that our cell membrane is embedded with many things, such as receptors, which is how cells receive signals from other cells. And as I said, this tells the cell how to modify its behavior. We also have transporters in the form of channels and carriers. And carriers, they transport large things, while channels allow small things to pass through. And I didn't mention this, but channels can also be gated meaning that they basically can open and, and close based on certain stimuli. So channels can also have gates that allow them to be open and closed. Water channels do not have gates, but things like sodium channels, potassium ions, they do have gates. We also know that our cells have identifiers on them, so the immune system can identify what belongs and what, what doesn't. They also serve many other purposes. And there's also enzymes in the cell surfaces that catalyze chemical reactions. All right, well, this is the end of part two of our chapter five discussion. Next is going to be something that is always a treat with, uh, with my classes, and that is osmosis and then diffusion. All right, over and out. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to our continuance of chapter five. So earlier, I gave you some lessons from the classroom. Today, you get a lesson from the green room. I'm currently visiting my parents, and when I do so, I give my lectures from the green room, also known as the room that nobody else wanted. So it's turned into my pseudo office. And yeah, that explains why the room is very green. But anyways, that's not super important right now, but to keep with the theme, I will draw an apparatus in green. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw an apparatus here, the straight lines as I can muster. And this apparatus is going to be separated down the center. I'll go down the center as much as possible by a semi-permeable membrane, just like a cell. So what this apparatus is designed to do, it is designed to simulate two separate em environments separated by a cell membrane. We're not really using any physiological examples right now. Right now, we're just looking at the rates of water movement because we're going to be talking about a process called osmosis. And it is defined on the outline, but just to give you a, another succinct definition, it is movement of water, movement of water from, and let's keep it simpler, toward a more concentrated environment. So basically, if you have an environment separated by a semi-permeable membrane, water will move toward the side of the membrane that is more concentrated. And let's go ahead and define that too. What is a concentration gradient? So concentration gradient That is going to be difference in solute concentration between two sides. Abbreviate between here, between two sides. So what I'm going to do is in one environment here, I'm going to put pure H2O. Pure H2O has an osmolarity of zero, by the way. And on the other side, I'm going to have three moles, what we call milliosmoles. And I'll put in a non-penetrating solute, as we call it, glucose. You're probably saying, well, what do you mean by three milliosmoles of glucose? Well, what I mean is that is the osmolarity of the solution. So let's go ahead and define that quickly. What is osmolarity? Osmolarity. It is the number, more or less, of non-penetrating solutes, meaning they cannot go through the cell membrane, over the equivalent of one liter of a solvent, which in this case is going to be water. So the number of non-penetrating solutes in a given amount of water, in this case, it will be one liter. We do that to find out the osmolarity of these, of these solutions. So we see here that the concentration gradient is pretty significant between the two sides. And of course, I'm doing that to illustrate the concept of osmosis. Now, how it works is that, is that water wants to reach equality between the two sides, meaning that water wants to be the unequal concentrations between two sides. And even if it can't do so, it certainly is going to try. So what's going to happen is that with us, with us osmosis, water always goes toward the more concentrated solution. So in this case here, H2O moves toward more concentrated side. 
very exactly what I wrote up, wrote up here actually. So the pure water is going to attempt to go into the area that has a higher concentration of non-penetrating solutes. So we'll see that a significant amount of water is going to try to go from the pure H2O side to the, to the environment that has the three milliosmoles of, of glucose. Because glucose cannot pass through the cell membrane, as I talked about last lecture. And as I talked about a bit earlier, the greater the, the concentration difference, then the greater the movement of water toward the more concentrated side. And just to make things a little bit more, more visible, I'll use this nice teal color, also keeping with the theme of green, to, to simulate the solutes in the, in the uh, solution. Now, let's say I were to tamper with this a bit. Let's say that I were to, I'll just, I'll just give you some examples for fun. I'll call this side B, I'll call this side A. Let's say instead I'm going to put in three moles, three milliosmoles of sodium. Hmm. Well, would the constant would the movement of os osmosis change? And the answer is yes, it would. What would happen is that water would not move at all. And that's because with osmosis, we're not concerned with what the solutes are. We're concerned with the concentrations. So in this case, there would be no water movement. Because the osmolarity is the same on each side. Recall that osmolarity is the number of non-penetrating solutes over one liter of water does not matter what those solutes are. So if the osmolarity is the same between two sides, water's not going to move. All right, let's go back to our, our starting ex experiment. So we're gonna erase this, go back to pure H2O. Excuse me as I reset this. When you do your physio X activity, you can just easily reset the apparatus, but not in Professor Thomas's lecture, not that fancy. All right, now we use some terms to describe the difference in solute concentration between each side. And it is called os osmolarity. So we have some, some terms here to talk about when we compare the osmolarity between two environments. So I'll just call this comparing osmolarity. Now the first term is going to be hypoosmotic. This side has less solutes. Now we also have a term called hyperosmotic. And as you imagine, that means more solutes. And the third one is going to be called isoosmotic. And this means same solutes. One thing to, to note though, is that only one side can, can, uh, can be, for example, hypoosmotic. Because if one side is hypoosmotic, the other must be hyperosmotic. And both sides need to be isoosmotic. So what I would like you to do now is I'm going to ask you a question of the day. So if you go to the discussion board, you'll see something that says um, chapter five, question of the day one. I would like you to complete that now. And you can do that by pausing this lecture, answering it, and then coming back. But the, the question for you is, is list the osmolarity of each of these sides. Is side A hyperosmotic? 
is side B hypoosmotic? Are both these sides isoosmotic? So let's go ahead and put down in the answer, A is whatever osmolarity you think it is, B is whatever os osmolarity you think it is. So go ahead and pause this and then come back. Okay, well, I hope you did pause it and not just wait for me to tell you the answers and then completed it on the dis discussion board. As I said before, is that you are given points for mostly correct answers. As long as you give the, give the, uh, the, the question an, an honest effort, you'll get full points. But I know that some students do not want to give an honest effort. They just want to put down, I don't know, or something like that. Kind of hard to give points to that. So as long as you give an honest effort, then, then I'll be a happy teacher. But anyway, side A, which has fewer solutes, this is going to be hypoosmotic. And side B that has more solutes is going to be hyperosmotic. Hyper means too much, hypo means not enough. So this side has too much solutes, this side has not enough solutes, therefore water is going to go to the hyperosmotic side. Now, if both these environments had the same osmolarity, they both would be isoosmotic. All right, great. So that is our quick dis discussion on osmolarity. But now we need to move All right, so we just talked about osmolarity and how that works. And now we're going to talk about a closely related term called tonicity, which is very important because now we're going to be switching more to the physiology side of things. Because with, with, with tonicity, the very term means pertaining to cell size or shape. And this is in, uh, and when we, we talk about, about tonicity, we talk about it in terms of the solution that these cells are in. So I'm gonna tell you a, a, a quick story that I, I learned, and this is kind of talked about in your case study as well, but there was something called water poisoning. And it was common in the early to mid 1900s, at least that's, that's when it was most documented, is that athletes would begin to show symptoms of, give me one moment, my screen sharing is pause for whatever reason. Ah, oh, here we go. Is that athletes would, would begin to show symptoms of something called, of, of, symptoms of what appeared to be heat stroke. And what they would do is that to help them with this is they would give them more water, which unfortunately um, made their, their condition worse. And in several uh, circumstances, these people died. And they called this water toxicity because they learned what happened is that when somebody, um, when someone exercises vigorously, their, the ions that are contained in their, in their blood actually go to the, the surface of their, of their skin to become sweat. So actually, um, plasma in their, in their blood actually goes through their sweat glands and becomes sweat. And of course, when that happens, it brings ions with it and the blood becomes more, di di more dilute. So what happened is that these, these people were, were showing symptoms um, that were caused by their blood becoming too dilute. Since their blood was, more di was, was becoming more and more dilute, what would happen is that water would go from, their, um, from the blood into their cells. Because recall that the movement of osmosis goes from a low concentration of solutes to a high concentration of solutes. Water would move from the blood into the cells. The cells would expand, they would, they would um, swell, and this led to a lot of 
of uh, very unfortunate consequences because neurons, cells in the brain, when this would happen with neurons is that the neurons would begin to, ex to expand, increasing um, what we call intracranial pressure because the neurons would, ex would expand in size, but the cranium cannot expand in turn. So what happened is that this pressure on the brain caused irreversible brain damage. And that, of course, was the last stage of water toxicity. So we, our, our body normally does, though, does a very good job of maintaining um, what we call an isotonic solution. And to show you that, I'm going to use a sample here, a cell called an erythrocyte, also known as a red blood cell. And this cell has about 250 milliosmoles of solutes inside. Now you're probably saying, well, what are those solutes? And can, they, and can they leave? The answer is no. Is these solutes are mainly things that comprise the red blood cells mass, like lots of uh, hemoglobin protein. So this cell is always going to have about 250 milliosmoles of stuff in it. And this, this pretend beaker that I drew is going, going to represent the outside environment. And under, under normal circumstances, it's going to have a very similar osmolarity. But in this case, we are going to refer to the concentration of the outside solution as tonicity, because tonicity pertains to cell size or shape, depending on this number here, will determine whether or not the cell is going to gain or lose water and thus change shape. So in this case here, we see that the concentration between the inside environment and the outside environment is the same. So we're going to say that this is an isotonic solution. Because of that, water is going to enter the cell, but it's also going to leave the cell. Because water doesn't stay still. It's going to be constantly moving in and out of the cell. Because of that, the, water's, the cell is neither going to gain nor lose water. It's going to be equal. And because of that, we are, are going to say that this cell is going to stay the same size. So there will be no change in cell size. Um, our systematic body cells want to be in an isotonic solution, but there are times when we actually do want a concentration gradient. Like when we talk about the renal system, you'll see how, how it's imperative that the environments are not the same, same concentration. But that will be much later on. Well, not much, it's a pretty short semester, maybe like a month from now. All right, now what about if we're, if we're gonna slightly change things? So I'm gonna go back in time here. And instead, I'm going to make the concentration of the outside environment, I'm going to make this instead, um, give me one moment here, my Zoom settings got mixed up. Okay, cool. I'm going to make this now in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic meaning not enough. So what has happened here is that the outside solution has fewer solutes than the inside of the cell. Well, what's going to happen is that water is going to enter the cell. Because recall, water goes from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration. The greater the difference between these two numbers, the greater the rate of water, water movement. It's a pretty significant difference. So in dotted lines, I'm going to draw how the cell will change size, and we'll see that the cell is actually going to become bigger, going to become swollen. And if the cell increases in size too much, it will just burst. Okay. So in a hypotonic solution, water will enter the cell and the cell will increase in size. All right, so this is now going smaller. 
And now we are going to once again change the experiment. And now we're going to put the cell in a hyper tonic environment. So it's going to be hypertonic. Let's go ahead and make this number something nice and simple, 400. What's going to happen now is that the, the, uh, the extracellular environment is going to become more concentrated. And this can happen in things such as um, dehyd dehydration, water is lost, but the solutes stay the same, so osmolarity of the outside solution goes up. Water will leave the cell. What will happen is that the cell is going to shrink. So I'll draw this in dots, how the cell will change size. The cell will shrink because water is going from the cell into the outside solution. And this has just as much of a detrimental effect, physiologically speaking. So we don't want our cells to change size too much. But, but the renal system in amazing system usually does a very good job of keeping those, those concentrations the same, keeping osmolarity the same between the two sides. All right, so now we are going to talk about a concept called diffusion. And diffusion is a bit different than osmosis because osmosis assumes that, all right, you have, you have two environments, one or more of the environments has a non-penetrating solute. So water is going to move to equalize the amount of water on each side. Diffusion is different. So with, with diffusion, water will not move because the solutes are able to diffuse. So diffusion is molecular movement from a high to low concentration. Now there are several small experiments you can do. One experiment you can do is take Fib Febreze and, and you can spray it on one side of your, of your room. I would do it in here, but this room is very small, so I will be getting a huge whiff of Fib that breeze in no time flat. But if, if you have a large house or a large, large kitchen, go on one side, spray some fit, fit breeze, and then go to, to, to the other side of the room. And in a couple of seconds or minutes, you will begin to smell the fit, fit breeze. Because, because what happens with, with diffusion, I'll go ahead and draw a room here. So this is a room. And let's say somebody sprays Febreze on this side of the room here. I'll do Febreze in terms of green. What's going to happen is that the molecules are going to be very tightly packed together. Now, not to bore you too much about chemistry or, or kinetics, but these molecules are constantly moving. They're constantly vib vibrating like this. This is just the natural energy from the cosmos or, or, or whatever term you want to use. So what's, what's, so what's happening, and I'll, I'll, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll kind of zoom in on this here, is these, these molecules are moving. They're moving in all these different directions. And, and what happens is that they are, are going to make contact with another similar molecule because this one is also moving. And when they hit, they're going to push each other away. So it's, so it's going to look like this. And they're going to become more, more spread out. Now, this is definitely not social distancing approved, but it would be like if I were to um, uh, blindfold 30 people in a, in, a, in a classroom, 
And each time you make you made contact with someone, you the only rule was you would have to push them away. Eventually, what would happen is that is that the molecules would, would keep on, on pushing each other until they became evenly distributed in the in the room. So this eventually would look like this. The molecules would be as spread out as possible because randomly they would make contact with each other. They would start to push each other and they would move as far away as possible. There's several examples you can do. You can take some food coloring, put it in a, in a glass of water, and you'll see the particles of the coloring begin to disperse throughout the rest of the, of the solution. Uh, you can also speed this up too by doing something called stirring. You can do something, for example, you can take um, a packet of sugar, put it in your, in your coffee, and after a while, the, the sugar is going to uh, dissolve and be, then become dis distributed throughout the coffee. But normally, we don't want to wait that long, so we, so we uh, stir it to speed it up. And the fusion, as I said, goes down the concentration gradient. The more, the more concentrated the, the particles are, then the faster they will separate because the more tightly packed they are, the more, the more they're, they're going to hit each other and the more they are, are, are going to separate out. So let's go ahead and talk about factors um, that impact the speed of uh, diffusion. And it's on your outline, so I'm not going to cover it too in-depthly. Let me just go ahead and, and embrace this. And the first is going to be distance. So the first factor is going to be distance. So these are factors that affect diffusion. More or less, the greater the, the distance, then the, uh, let me see how to, how to put this. So the, the, the greater the distance, the slower the diffusion rates. To give you an example, this is going to be the alveoli of the lungs, so drawn here, containing oxygen, which I'll draw here in pink. And we'll say that this is going to be the blood. Gases want to get into the blood. Now, in this case here, they're, they're pretty close, but what about if there is uh, pulmonary edema? What if, in, what if, in fact, there is a buildup of, of water between the alveoli and the blood and the, the, the distance that the oxygen needs to move is increased? What's, what's going to happen is it's going to take the oxygen longer to get from the alveoli to the, to the blood. So what's, what's going to happen is that the rates of diffusion is going to go down because the distance has, in, has increased. So the greater the distance, the slower the rate of uh, diffusion. That's why it's really not, not, not good to have this space um, increased because it's going to, to delay the, the rate that oxygen gets in, in, into the blood. Okay, next example here is going to be molecular size, meaning the size of the, of the, the molecules. So size, oops. Here we have the larger the size, the slower the diffusion rate, abbreviated diffusion rate. That's just because large things move slower. Next is temperature. Recall that, that, that temperature usually speeds up activity of things. In this case, the higher the temperature, the higher 
diffusion rates. And of course, with all of these, the inverse is also true. Gradient, as we talked about, the steeper the gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. So the steeper the gradient, the faster the diffusion rate. Next, we have surface area. So surface area is actually the amount of um, surface um, well, to keep it simple, the, uh, the amount of surface uh, area on a cell where things, things can enter and leave. No, that isn't the best, best definition right now, but surface area is the amount of space available on the surface of an environment. And the greater the surface area, the greater the diffusion rate, because there's more places for the molecule to diffuse through. Uh, and you'll, you, you'll see here on the bottom of the outline something says os versus osmosis. Keep in mind that os osmosis is H2O movement in the presence of non-penetrating solutes. Non penetrating solutes. So in that example, these solutes don't don't move so much, so the water has to. Because there's a a difference in the concentration of solutes between one environment to the other, water has to move. Diffusion though is movement of specific solutes from one environment to the other. Yes, so that also reminds me with osmosis, the solutes do not matter, just the osmolarity of each environment. With diffusion, the amount of a specific solute on one side or the other determines how much that that solute moves so for example if you are, are if you are going to try 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 to measure the diffusion rate of sodium you are going to compare the amount of sodium on each side of the cell if you are going to measure the rate of uh, glucose transport you're only concerned with the uh, with the amount of glucose on each side of the cell so it is solute specific with diffusion where with os osmosis the solutes do not matter, just the difference of non-penetrating solutes on each side. All right, we'll be going over more examples of this later on. So I'm going to pause here and then we will continue next with what we call facilitated diffusion. All right, class, now we're going to switch gears to talk about facilitated diffusion. And what facilitated diffusion is, is it is diffusion transport from one, from one environment to the next using the assistance of transporters. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw here now uh, a part of the cell membrane. As you recall, it is a double layer membrane and we're going to have two types of transporters in there these ones here called channels so put here in orange and then these ones here called carriers so put here in bright green much like the room i am teaching from so these are going to be carriers And these are going to be channels. And we'll go ahead and talk about channels first. Now, channel proteins are very similar to tunnels. 
what they are is that they can either be gated or, well, open. And examples of channels that are always open, there's a couple examples of them, mainly aquaporins, which allow water to pass through, and also something called a potassium leak channel. I generally don't talk too much about potassium leak channels because that's a lot more biochemistry, and it kind of uh, gets in the way of a lot of things that I teach as foundational information. But those are examples of, of channels that are always open. Gated channels, though, these, uh, this means that the channel is usually closed until a certain stimuli opens it up. And one thing, I don't know if I already mentioned this, but channels mainly transports one of these, these three ions, H2O, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically it. Either, either ions, charged, small charged um, molecules, or water. And they can either be gated or open. There are three types of uh, gated channels. We have mechanical, voltage, and chemical. Let's go ahead and talk about these more. So the first then one that we'll, that we'll talk about types of channels, first one we'll talk about is mechanical. And this is physical stimuli opens channel. What this means is that this, this channel is going to be gated, it's going to be closed, and then a physical stimuli is going to happen and it's going to open up this channel. What is an example of that physical stimuli? Well, one example that no one likes is a nociceptor, also known as a pain receptor. But what activates the, the, the nociceptor is a channel called the sodium channel that opens up, allows sodium into the nociceptor, which activates it and sends the signal to the brain. Well, nociceptors, they respond to physical trauma. And if that uh, trauma is significant enough, it will activate the nociceptor. Don't purposely activate your, your, your nociceptors. You want to activate any kind of me mechanical um, uh, neuron in your your body. There are are uh, neurons that res that respond to changes in pressure. Press down on your desk. You feel pressure. Wait a couple seconds. The pressure will be gone because now the neuron has turned off. Turn on. You feel pressure. Turned off because there's been no change in stimuli. Interesting. Interesting. All right. The next one is called a voltage gated channel. And this is actually a change in membrane voltage. There are, are several examples of this that we'll be talking about. But what happens is that the cell membrane can actually be charged. And when that happens, it can actually open up channels um, that allow ions to move in and out. So voltage-gated channels, they open in response to a change of, well, voltage. Examples of that are more or less anything in your brain. Yeah, so most, most neurons in the central nervous system, and well, almost every, every neuron, is going to respond to changes in voltage. Uh, we'll be talking about that in chapter, I want to say chapter eight, maybe. But yeah, we'll be talking about it in a couple chapters. 
and next is going to be chemical. This is um, binding of a signal molecule to a receptor open channel. An example of this is there is a neurotransmitter, very common neurotransmitter in our bodies called acetylcholine. And it can bind to receptors on the surfaces of cells called nicotinic receptors. When acetylcholine binds with a nicotinic receptor, it opens up a sodium channel. So that's an example of a chemically gated uh, channel. Carrier proteins, they work in a little bit, bit more of a simple manner, is that they are specific, oh, and, and by the way, channels are also specific to one molecule. Same with, same with carriers, they are also specific. So that is that is that something that is large, and polar usually is going to bind with the carrier transporter and it will be able to travel into the cell or out of the cell. An example of this is going to be what is called a GLUT protein. What happens is that that glucose binds with it and then that glucose is transported in, into the cell. Uh, now, a glute protein is an example of what is called a unipore. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a, uh, the types of carriers. So I'm not going to be lazy this time. I'm going to actually write it out. So we have here types of carriers. First type of carrier is going to be called a unipore, which is exactly what I was talking about is one molecule is transported by a transport protein. Simple enough, but now we get into something called a symporter. Now this is a type of carrier, I'll go ahead and draw it on the side, side here. It's going to look like this. We'll say this U or this divot is for sodium and this square is for glucose. So what a symporter is, and this is a symporter called the sodium glucose symporter is two molecules are transported in the same direction. With the caveat being that before this carrier can be activated, both sodium and glucose need to be present. And you're probably saying, okay, professor, but why does that make sense? Why is it that that, that symporters even exist? And the answer is, is that it usually is more efficient. So that happens in the case of a sodium, sodium glucose symporter is that sodium is going to move down its concentration gradient, meaning it's going from a high to low concentration. And it's going to take something larger like, like, like glucose and it's going to pull it along with it. 
using a type of a gradient called an electrochemical gradient. We'll talk about that later on in this chapter, but basically what happens is that sodium is positively charged and glucose is negatively charged. Because of that, they're, uh, they're attracted. The movement of sodium can move along the much, much larger glucose molecule, saving the body energy. So, so usually symporters, their advantage is energy efficiency. The movement of one, one molecule moves along the other as well, sort of like a buy one, get one free kind of a deal. And the next one we're going to talk about uh, is called an antiport. And so let's see if I can screw this on the bottom. Antiport. Anti means against. Two molecules are moved against concentration gradient. And we'll be talking about these a lot because the most well, well known of this is called the sodium potassium antiporter. More green to go along with the theme of my, my uh, office. So what happens is that sodium is going to go against this concentration gradient. And potassium is going to move the opposite way also against its concentration gradient. The goal of this is our cells want to get all the sodium on one side of the cell and all the potassium on the inside of the cell. And this is a very energy hungry process. Um, I, I, I gotta double check this, but I think that about 60% of all the energy we expend throughout the day is used just to power sodium potassium pumps. So it is a very energy in, intensive process. All right, so let's go ahead and recap the carriers. Uh, oh, and by the way, these, uh, this class here is called, they're called co-transporters. Co-transporters. And of course, our two classes are symport and antiport. Uh, uniport carriers are simple. What happens is that a molecule binds with it, either large or small and it is actually escorted from one side of the cell to the other. A symporter, both molecules are transported in the same, same direction. The movement of one molecule pulls along the other one in as, as well. With nanotyporter, both molecules are moved against their concentration gradient, requiring a significant amount of energy. and they're both moved in opposite directions. All right, so that is our part on facilitated diffusion. Um, now we're gonna talk about active transport next. So active transport is a form of facilitated diffusion. However, it needs to use energy. Uh, the antiport was an example of an active transport. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this redraw our cell membrane. Okay, and we're gonna talk about active transport. So what happens here is that energy is needed to move one or more solutes against their concentration gradients. And as I said, this is a very energy intensive process. 
because, and I don't think I did a very good job of, ex of explaining this earlier. Um, when does diffusion stop? In fact, I don't even think I, I brought that up. But basically, diffusion stops when all the molecules in an environment have reached, would have reached equilibrium, meaning that they are, are, they, 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 are, they are evenly spread out throughout the environment. So if I were to take a, a can of Fib, Fib Breeze and spray it all in one area, it's going to start out like this, just all packed together, and they're going to keep on moving so now, now the fusion is going to happen and they're going to be evenly spread out. And then in that case, movement of molecule stops. Now the problem is, is what would happen if you wanted these molecules all to be packed into the corner of the room? Well, that would be very hard. You would, you would need to expend energy to do so. Because these molecules really don't want to be to, together. Well, there are times or there are, are numerous situations in our body where we don't want molecules to, to, to become, become evenly distributed. Sometimes we all want them packed on one side of the cell or the other side of the cell. And that is the point of active transport. So, what it is, is what it is going to do be is recall that in passive diffusion, passive and facilitated diffusion, these are both types of, um, of diffusion that, re that, re that, requires, that requires no energy. These molecules are always going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration from, from where there's more to where there's less. And it's going to stop when it becomes equal. However, active transport, it is moving the opposite. So instead, areas where there are less is going to go to areas where it is more. And this takes energy. If any of you have ever driven up the canal gradient, also known as the canal grade, you, you probably uh, have realized that you take quite a hit in fuel economy when you, you do so. That's because when you are moving up a gradient, you need to expend a significant amount of energy. Going down the canal gradient, if you wanted to, not recommended, but, but you could actually put your, your car in neutral and coast down using no energy at all. Bad idea, don't, don't do it. Don't listen to professor all the time. So this is the idea behind active transport is what if you want, for example, um, a sig significant difference in solute concentration depending on the size, depending on the em environment. And the first one is going to be called, um, primary act, act of transport. So this is going to be, I'll just call this a pump. So whenever you, you see a, a transporter called a pump, that means it is, it is going to move a solute against its concentration gradient, one or more. So one is primary act of transport. And what, what this is, is that one or more, so one or more solutes move against their gradient. Okay. The other one, though, is called secondary active transport. So I'll put a box here, secondary active transport. And with this one here is 
once again, going with energy efficiency is one molecule goes down gradient. Other molecule goes against it. So what this does is that it kind of is a way to do, do active transport, but with much more energy efficiency. So that happens is that one molecule is going to go down this gradient, but it's going to attract another molecule that's going against its, its gradient. So it's, a, so it's a way of doing active transport while using the, the, the kinetic energy of another molecule. We'll, and we'll be going over more examples of these as we go through the semester. Take home, home messages though is that, is that active transport uses energy to move a molecule against its, its concentration gradient. And this is necessary for many different physiological processes in our body. We, we, we talk about action potentials, you'll see exactly why um, active transporters are so important. All right, now what are some things that affect the rate of carrier mediated transport? Well, this will actually, um, you'll actually be able to practice this a bit in the PhysioX lab. We'll know right here, factors affecting carrier mediated transport. And the first one is going to be number of transporters. So the more transporters, the faster diffusion speed. which makes sense, right? This is going to be a cell membrane. And let's say that I wanna transport six glucose molecules from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell. So say that green is going to be glucose. And here I have glute proteins. Now, if I have two glute proteins, it's going to transport these, the, the glucose molecules a lot slower than if I have four glute proteins, or five, or six. So the, so the more glute transporters I have, the more these, these, these glucose molecules can be transported at once. So the greater the number of transporters, the faster the diffusion speed. And then the same, same mark, the next one is going to be what we call saturation. So the greater the saturation, Well, it's kind of hard to say here because saturation, well, here, I'll, I'll say it like, like this. The, the greater the, the saturation, the slower the rate of diffusion. Now, rate of diffusion is more or less, um, how often it occurs in a time period. So what we see here is that if all of these, these um, glue transporters are saturated, meaning, meaning they're occupied, 
what that what that means is that the rates of diffusion is not going to 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 be able to increase so we'll say that here we have five blue transporters we see that they're all currently activated or or, or saturated with with uh, 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 glucose molecules, so we have we have max we have maximized the rate of uh, transport. So, for example, the transport rates. I'll just say is five glucose per second. Now. Let's let's play with this a bit. So let's say here that I add another transporter, but I I don't add any more glucose molecules. Well, guess what? The transport rate would still be five five glucose molecules per second, but if I add add another glucose, now it would be six per second. So the greater this, the saturation, then the slower the rates of diffusion will, will be because it can no longer increase. I hope that, that kind of makes, makes sense. The, the, the Physio X lab does a pretty good job of explaining it too. And the next um, aspect is going to be be competition. So let me go ahead and do competition here. Competition. Actually, before I do that, I would be, I would be re remiss if I did not do, do do an enzyme saturation curve. So let me let me go ahead and do that because I don't really feel. I don't feel like I just did the greatest job of uh, talking about this. All right, so what I'm, I'm gonna do here is I'm going to draw five glucose transporters and I'm going to add in zero, zero glucose so far. And I'm going to draw an enzyme saturation curve here. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, actually I'm just gonna go ahead and clear the whole thing. Enzyme saturation curve. X-axis is is going to be um, concentration. Actually, we'll do this as saturation. And the y-axis is going to be rates. Now I'm going to draw a cell membrane that is going to have, I'll just say, we're going to have um, five glute carriers. And currently, I'm going to have zero, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to add one, one uh, uh, glucose molecule. OK? So right, right now, the saturation is very low, right? You have five glute transporters and only one glucose molecule. So the so the rate of transport is going to be, well, one per second, we'll just say. Now let's say I add a second, a second glucose molecule. It's going to be transported, and now we're we're going to be up to two per second. Now we're going to do three. We're going to add a third one. Third one is going to be transported. Now we can move three glucose molecules per second. Four. Now we can move four per second. Five. Now we can move five per second. Six. Well, guess what? Now this one has to wait in line. Still five per second. What if I add a seventh one? still five per second. What if I add an eighth one? Still five per second. 
so we see here that the greater this, the saturation is of the of the uh, blue blue transporters, then the then the uh, slower the the rate of transport is. And by by and by by slower, I guess it means it just doesn't go up anymore. Think of it like think of it like reaching your top your top speed. Let's say that your top speed is 10, 10 miles an hour. At first, it's at first when you start to sprint, your speed's going to go up, go up, up, up really fast. But the closer you you get to ten miles an hour, the slower the increases are are going to be. That's similar to the saturation point for solute transport through carrier proteins. Hopefully, that did a better job of. Of illustrating the idea. Now the next one is going to be competition. So this is transport speed of one solute depends on presence of another. Now you might recall me saying earlier that carriers and channels are specific to one to one solute or one molecule. That's true many times. Um, let's just say that we have here a a glute channel. And this, this particular glue transporter can either transport glucose or maltose. These are two types of sugars that are very, very, very closely related. Now, the more maltose there is, then the the slower the rate of glucose transport. The more glucose there is, the slower the rate of maltose transport. So the presence of, of glucose is going to slow down the transport rate of maltose and vice versa. So if I have a very big, big distribution here, I see I have lots of maltose and only one and only a, a couple of of of, um, of uh, glucoses. What's going to happen is that that glucose is, is is going to transport slowly compared to maltose. It would be like if I were to to give you a bag containing twenty marbles, and and I would ask you to keep on pulling out marbles until you pulled out all of the blue ones. Let's say there's 15 red ones and five and five blue ones. It will take you longer to find those five those five um, blue ones because there's so many red ones. Similar to to this, if you have a transporter that can transport uh, two or, or more different types of solutes, the greater the number of the others are, that will determine how fast the solute in question is transported. Therefore, if you want, want um, this, this transporter to optimally transport for glucose, then you cannot have maltose present and vice versa. So the greater the presence of one solute, the slower the, pres or the, slower the transport of the other solute. The more maltose there is compared to glucose, the slower the rate of glucose transport, the greater the rate of maltose transport. All right, so those are the three types of transport uh, or, the, or the three different factors that determine the rates of carrier mediated transport. Well, welcome back everybody.
chapter five, you get to see all three of my working spaces. This is the home home office. You know I'm here, but there are not green walls. All right, so I drew here something called a macrophage. Macro means big, phage means to eat. So this means big eater. And what this does is it is going to engulf cellular debris and pathogens. However, here I'll draw a little bacteria. However, it is not going to use a transporter. It is not going to use passive diffusion. Instead, it is going to go through a process called endocytosis. And we, and we call this vesicular mediated transport. And there's a, there's a couple of examples of it. And on the bottom here, I'll draw a, a typical cell just so you can kind of get an example of what's going on. And the purpose of this is that sometimes cells need to transport very large things. So we call this bulk transport. Because facilitated diffusion using protein channels is a very tightly controlled process. This is not, this is move in or move out large amounts of things. And the first one that we have here to talk about is going to be phagocytosis, the process of eating. Phagocytosis is done by a couple of cells here, especially our friend, the macrophage. What it is going to do is it is going to wrap its fake arms, we call these here pseudopods, not necessary to, to know that, but it is going to take its fake arms and it's going to wrap around the pathogen or debris and it's going to engulf it. It's going to squeeze it into its, its body. What it's going to do here is it's going to use a series of digestive enzymes called lysozyme, and then it's going to degrade this pathogen into more or less just small particles. Then to get those, those particles out, it's going to do a reverse process called exocytosis to exit. So phagocytosis is the process of eating, I guess you can say. Exocytosis is going to be bulk exporting. And endocytosis, which this is in the, an example of endocytosis here. Endocytosis is bulk import. Let me squeeze that down here. No, it's kind of small. Now, there is a process that we're, that we're going to just, just, just touch up. Well, first let me show you exactly how this works. Now, this here I'm, I'm going to draw is called a vesicle. And a vesicle is basically a small cell membrane made up of phospholipids. And I compare it to a shipping box. So we see here, we have the phospholipid by, by layer, and the inside is going to be some kind of process, some kind of product, my apologies. So what happens is that when this, this vesicle is received by a cell, it's actually going to rejoin the phospholipid membrane. It's going to be absorbed back into it. And then the products are going to be more or less just dumped inside. And the same thing is going to happen with exocytosis. Now we're going to talk about a, a process, um, I believe it's chapter eight, called calcium mediated exocytosis. So here we have again the vesicle fusing and it is going to dump out the products. 
So this is exocytosis. So we do have a product process called calcium mediated exocytosis, where calcium actually comes into the cell like so. And it is going to assist this vesicle with binding with the membrane. Very important part or aspect of neurotransmission. So once again, vesicular mediated transport is for bulk transport. Endocytosis is the process of bringing large amounts of things inside a cell. An example of that is phagocytosis, the process of eating. And that is done by a macrophage, brings in a pathogen or something else large, goes into the cell, digested, then the products are dumped out via exocytosis. Uh, we also have a similar process, calcium-mediated exocytosis, where calcium, which as you'll, you'll learn about, calcium is a ubiquitous second messenger. You'll learn about that process next chapter. And calcium is actually going to come in and it's going to assist with the vesicle binding with the cell membrane. All right, radical. So now we're on to our last part of chapter five. And it is called epithelial transport, which is done through, not surprisingly, epithelial cells. So I'm going to draw some epithelial cells here. Epithelial cell, epithelial cell. And this, this next one, I'm going to purposely draw a little bit of space. Just, you'll see why. And as I was saying earlier, is that these cells are anchored with tight junctions to keep them nice and close to, to, uh, together. So even though they're they're unique cells, they are linked together. And you know this because each cell has a nuclei. Okay, this cell is also anchored with tight junctions, but remember, I'm, I'm leaving this space here for a reason. Now, the, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the, the difference between secretion and absorption. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that these are cells of the integument. These are cells of the epidermal layer. Not exactly a super accurate representation, but it's to, to, it's to, to illustrate a point, not to teach a concept. Well, it is a teach a concept, but also to illustrate a point. I know that seems very uh, mind-blowingly confusing. And this is going to be the surface of the, of the, of the skin. And then we, we know that at the very bottom of, of epithelial layers, we're, we're gonna have a collection of, um, of uh, connective tissue. We also need a blood supply because these are cells. And we also need a layer of lymphatic vessels as well. I'm just, I'm just drawing kind of the, just trying to, to make this as detailed as possible. Now, the side of the epithelial cells that is, that is going to face some kind of surface or, some, or something called a lumen, which is the inside of an organ, we call this the apical side. Apical means, well, top. And the side that faces away from the lumen, which my, my kind of chief for that is the side that, that is closest to the, to the uh, connective tissue and blood, blood vessels, we call it the basolateral side. Now, when something goes, well, actually, let me define this first. So first, we're going to talk about Transcytosis. Trans means across. Cytosis refers to cells. 
And this goes from apical to basal lateral or vice versa through the cell. So what's going to happen is that we are going to have some, some sort of compound. I don't know, let's say you put some high quality lotion on your skin. Actually going to be, actually no, lotion would, would, would go through a different pathway. Okay, we'll just say random, random thing. When they go through the, through the cell, when to, to come out the other end of it. It's actually moving through the cell. We call this transcytosis. Now the next one, which would be a great example for high quality lotion, is called paracellular transport. Paracellular means next to cell. So what this is, is that the compound is going to sneak between the cells so it's, so, so it's not gonna go through the cells, it's going to squeeze next to them. And it can also go either way, transcytosis, or sorry, um, it can go either apical to basal lateral or basal lateral to, to, to apical. So paracellular transport is next to cell. All right, now, Going, going back to what we were talking about is transport. We have two other terms to talk about. One is called secretion. Recall that I said that transport can go either direction through the cell. So this refers to transcytosis. Secretion is from, well actually, both transcytosis and paracellular transport. Sorry for the confusion. So sec secretion goes from basolateral to apical because when you secrete something, you are putting it toward the surface of the body or into the lumen. And the next one is going to be absorption. Cannot spell today. That is going to be apical to basal lateral. And one other term that I mentioned, ex excretion is just out of the body. Usually we, we, we uh, use ex, 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 excretion when we talk about the process of urination or defecation. So excretion is out of the body. I've had some students in the past ask if sweating is an example of excretion. Technically it kind of is. It's an example of secretion and ex excretion, take your pick. All right, so once again, transcytosis is when a compound actually travels through the cell. If it goes from the, um, the basal lateral to apical side, then we call it secretion. When we talk about apical to basal lateral, we talk about absorption. We also have something called paracellular transport, which is going next to the cells. We'll talk about some examples of this as we go through the semester. All right, well, I hope you all enjoyed this last part of our chapter five lecture. And of course, if you have any questions, we can talk about it during office hours. All right, see you guys again for chapter six.